history, which is fascinating. I mean, this is a guy who was quite the athlete. At one point, he bowled a 300 game, perfect game. He got in the boxing ring with the heavyweight champion of the world, John L. Sullivan, and boxed a few rounds with him. I mean, the guy was amazing. He moved from New York, where he was an attorney, and they told him, you need a climate that's better for your, your uh, respiratory system, because if you stay in New York, you'll die prematurely. So he moved to Arizona, which at that time was considered to be a healthier climb. And so he went there. Now consider, Cabot was not a young guy. He was already a grown-up when he moved to Phoenix. He was 61 years later when he formed NSA, or when he gave his first speech, and 60-something when he formed NSA. Um, Cabot moved to Phoenix, and there was no real estate association. Was not. He wrote the test other people took to get their real estate license. His real estate license was number one for the state of Arizona. Unbelievable. <laughs> and this is a guy that at one point had his own plane, um, owned a hotel, you know, just all kinds of fascinating facets to Cabot. One of the things in here that I think you'll enjoy, if they still have some copies of this, I'm sure, pretty sure they do, is his daughter, Lee, who is, I'd say, in her uh, late 40s, early 50s now, she interviewed him and asked him some of the greatest questions. And it's in here. She asked him questions like, where'd you get your beliefs? Was there a time when the beliefs you grew up with changed, and what was the reason for the change? What caused you to believe that you, know, you should ship what you think is so? And another question she asked him is, what do you think happens after you die? In other words, what, how do you deal with the changes in your body as you're growing older? You know, when systems are going offline, to use my terms. Um, so it's, a, it's really a fascinating piece of work. Cabot Robert, Leaving a Lasting Legacy, published by the National Speakers Association. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a few copies of that left. Now, this book, Paid to Speak, I wrote, of course, the introduction to it, as many of you already know. And let me explain how um, the concept of competencies and professional education in NSA has evolved over the years. When I joined in 76, I was a newbie, you know, I, I was just doing everything I could to get a speech and, and uh, when people say, what do you do, I'd say I'm a motivational speaker and they'd say, what's that? What does that mean? <coughs> and so I would try to explain it as best I could and they'd say, oh, well our people could use that and so I'd end up with a booking and I'd take you know, it's, at first, I was getting anything from $100 to whatever, you know, free lunch. That would pretty much cover it. And then I got more and more sophisticated as I compared notes to other people. And um, the, uh, the reason I pause is I want to be sure and tell you why this is a statue. I'll, I'll get to that. Remind me if I forget to come back to it. So, um, when I joined, there was no path in NSA. It was just, we had meetings. And if you were this year's meeting chair, then you chose what Marilyn thought was the best mix of speakers and topics, okay? Or if, if, if Jim was president and you were the meeting chair, then we'd probably collaborate. I was the convention's chair in 1982, and we held three conventions. We held two winter workshops, one east, one west, and that year it was New Orleans and, and Newport Beach. And those conventions were uh, basically two days, a half, a full, and a half. Kind of like the one coming up in San Francisco. And uh, the ones in New Orleans and, and um, Newport Beach were many versions of the main convention, which that year was in Chicago. And it was about four days long and involved all our members and we'd have out of, at the time, oh, probably 1,500 total members. We had, I uh, guess, 600 in attendance in Chicago. Today, we have 
just under, just at 3,000 members nationally, and um, we'll have close to 2,000 show up for our annual conventions. So it's amazing. I, I talk with people about it. They say, national speakers, you've got your own association? I said, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a full-blown association with its own headquarters building in Phoenix, and, and uh, which is paid for, by the way. It's a conference center. And in addition to that, we've got a foundation with a few million dollars in it that grants uh, scholarships to students and professors. And, uh, you know, it, it's a big deal. And they say, wow, speakers. I say, yeah, the National Speakers Association Convention is a gathering of a few thousand professional speakers. And then I pause and I say, no, listen. <laughs> but, but, you know, and that's just done for humor, because the reality is, the best audience in the world is NSA members. Why? Because every one of them empathizes with you, and every one of them is pulling for you. They want you to do well. And when you do well, they celebrate you very clearly. You know, you never wonder whether you're connecting with an NSA audience. And if you ever want to not connect with an NSA audience, Try to be dishonest. Get in front of them and put on an act instead of showing who you are. Don't tell them the truth. Act as if something that's obviously so is not so. I'll guarantee you that audience will turn on you. But they won't be mean about it. They'll just tune you out. Okay? So how do you succeed at NSA? Tell the truth. Period. Tell the truth. And be honest, honest and open with people. So, the years go by, I get involved in everything in NSA because I want to be accepted as a player, not just a new kid on the block. So I started doing like Hibba, you know, I'm raising my hand, I'm volunteering for everything. <laughs> and I'm getting the ball up, man, I'm at the meetings early, I'm setting up the room, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning off tables, I'm filling out name tags, I'm taking <coughs> rosters, I'm, I'm running errands and getting things, I'm keeping notes. And so someone said to me, Bill Johnson, who was the executive director of NSA at the time. By the way, that itself was kind of like the name in the first place, the National Speakers Association. The four of us are the National Association of the Light. <laughs> well, our executive director was a guy who said, no, I'll keep the records. Meaning he'd keep the membership records and send out a note to people, a handwritten note. That says your mem membership dues, 60 bucks, <laughs> are due. Please send them in. I, Bill Johnson and a secretary of his was the National Speakers Association at the time. When I was convention chair in 1982, now we've got 1,500 members, and we've got this big four-day convention and two weekend winter conventions, and our entire national staff was Bill Johnson and his secretary, Judy Graham. And I went to his home one time in Phoenix, and he showed me the uh, archives of, bless you, the archives of NSA. Four shoeboxes in his bedroom on a little uh, singer sewing machine table. You know, remember the days of those? Okay. And they were sitting on there just stacked up, and it was shoeboxes with cards in it, and that was in NSA's archives and membership records. <laughs> if you go to Phoenix, go to Tempe in Phoenix, and see the National Headquarters Conference Center today, it will blow you away by comparison. Absolutely a beautiful building. Tom, you were there recently, right? I was. Yeah. Uh, what were your great. impressions? I, I was really struck that, that a, a, a nonprofit organization would be uh, anchored by such a professional environment. It, it was really, suddenly said, oh, there's a home here. I, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I have to say, I got introduced to the NSA in New Jersey. And the difference, I think, regionally and so forth, I'm just astounded at the, uh, the foundation that the Los Angeles chapter is. This is really kind of off the charts compared to what's going on in chapters around the country, too. So I, I've been blessed to see a range of things, and I'm, I'm really very impressed with the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what's the current national staff size? You know, I, I couldn't count them. There's, there's enough people out there. There's enough people out there to uh, to handle that conference center. I, I, like 15 or 20. I was going to say, I, I saw at least a dozen people there, and this was over over a weekend. So yeah. I know that there was staff, I mean, all down the executive road, uh, they weren't all in, but uh, 
Yeah, it's, so it's, a going, it's a going, well-supported organization. Yeah, and it's, it's a very classy, upscale building, and um, they're true professionals. They're certified association executives, certified meeting professionals, people with credentials in each of the positions in NSA. And so there's a staff of somewhere around 20 people, probably less. Uh, they have a conference center. They have an archives. Uh, when you walk in one part of the building, you'll see this statue. And then you'll see plaques on the wall. There's, there's one wall that has plaques of the people who were the founders of the NSA headquarters building. And th those were the people that contributed. I think the minimum contribution was $4,500. Jim is out there on the wall. There's a couple of different walls out there. I think your picture's in two places. There's the whole thing of yeah. the founders. Right? Yeah, so but, uh, but I said I know that I know that guy. <laughs> that Tom Winninger from uh, Minnesota. Uh, he was the one who did the fundraising to bring us all together to create through our foundation that building. And uh, so we all pooled our money and did it and opened the doors and the thing was paid. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's talk about this for a second. Every year, starting in 1979, NSA started giving the, uh, or gives, to use, get back to my Senate structure, every year we give the Cabot Award to one individual who it is determined is the most like Cabot was in his or her behavior their professional behavior. Cabot was the kind of guy who, even when he was in his 80s, would be sitting in the front row of every meeting at every convention, just paying attention and taking notes and encouraging you. You know, when you'd look at the audience, he's looking right back at you. And he's really involved, even if he had no clue what you were talking about. <laughs> you could tell he was there to help you succeed, right? So Cabot was that kind of a guy. and. He would mentor anybody. He had more protégés than he could count. People would say, you know, I'm interested to be, well, I'll take you, I'll help you out, you know. So he'd share information, he'd, he'd uh, accept phone calls and do coaching over the phone, no pay, just, just eager to do it to help grow the profession. And he just had such a giving spirit. I remember one time I was sitting at lunch with him we were in a small group together years later called Speakers Roundtable, which is a mastermind alliance I'm part of today. And it's been around since before NSA, actually. It used to be a tip club among people that, that gave presentations. You know, a tip club, like a, a marketing network. And um, Speakers Roundtable uh, had the meeting that year in Newport Beach, and Cabot and his wife Trudy and my wife Paula and I and Danny Cox and his wife, Theo, were sitting at lunch. And Kevin turned to me and he said, you guys have done so much more than this, with this than I ever thought. He said, I, you know, I had big dreams for NSA. I have no idea it would ever be this good. And that was really nice to hear. And it, it, that's the truth. You know, he didn't have this big of a concept in mind when he started it. But as it evolved and as we got active in it, we started contributing our own ideas for how to grow it, and it grew phenomenally. 